Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're calling from. Uh, thank you for joining us at the Writers of the Best ARC. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by the National Technical Assistance to Brownfields Program, which is funded by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, if you not, have not already done so, uh, this webinar, the webinar materials can be downloaded uh, on the console uh, by clicking on uh, the console to your right. The webinar will be recorded and available after the webinar, and uh, we will also uh, have a survey that we request that everyone fill out because all your comments are important to us. Uh, before we proceed, we have a few polling questions to find out who is calling uh, and so that everyone else knows who's calling in. First question is, uh, there's a map here of uh, locations and we'd like to know which tab region you are calling from. Results are in and we have about 30% from regions 2, 4, I mean 2, 9, and 10, 40 from regions 5, 6, 7, and 8, and about 25 from uh, regions uh, 1, 3, and 4, and some folks don't know where uh, you're calling from, and we can, uh, uh, you can ask a question and you can uh, answer that question for you through the polling questions, I mean through the uh, console if you want to know. Uh, and our next polling question is, what sector do you work in? Okay, results are coming in, mostly from local or state government, about 50%. 4% uh, from the federal government, 13 from nonprofit, and 33% from the private sector. And our next polling question is, How many years have been have you been in the land reuse field? So uh, results are coming in. A lot of folks that have uh, five years or less experience, about half of you, and the rest spread out across the others. Though we have about uh, uh, one fifth of you have five to ten years experience. So uh, I would say a pretty young crowd. And that's what we're here for, is to uh, help educate you on all things brownfields. Uh, we have a great presentation for you today. Uh, I will introduce speakers from, uh, which are Logan Smith with Siskiyou County Economic Development Council, Ann Wallace from the city of Knoxville, Tennessee, and Steve Lefevre with Barton and Lugidis. And, uh, and the three tab technical assistance to Brownfield grantees. Uh, we thank you uh, very much uh, for sharing your knowledge and experience. Uh, after the grantees speak, we will have a short question and answer, and you, uh, people can uh, start uh, writing their questions in, uh, even during the uh, con uh, even while they're giving the presentation. And uh, at the end of everyone's presentations, we will again uh, open it up to questions. Again, thank you to our speakers. Uh, we can't do these presentations without you. And just for a bit, bit of background on the EPA assessment, RLS, and cleanup grant. The table on the left shows the recent history. Uh, it's been fairly level. The funding levels have been fairly level the last three years. Uh, assessment grants have been continually uh, been more competitive. Uh, since the coalition grants were offered, the coalition assessment grants, uh, they have been increasing, indicating that smaller communities are banding together and uh, submitting proposals together. And, uh, and competition really varies. Uh, uh, there's no specific trend, uh, but it is getting more competitive. And as for fiscal year 2018, uh, funding levels 
and allocation of funds can't be determined until uh, Congress uh, and the Senate and the, uh, the President work out the budget. So those are all in play. But we do know that there will be an ARC uh, competition. Uh, it may open up as early as August or as late as October, and there will be a 60-day uh, period. So with that, I am going to hand over the floor to our first speaker, Logan Smith, with the Siskiyou County Economic Development Council. Logan? Thank you, Ignacio. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, wonderful. Well, I'm very honored to be considered a uh, successful grantee, and uh, it, I feel happy that I can uh, also represent rural brownfields and uh, uh, small communities in general. Uh, those of you who are in small areas, uh, don't despair. Uh, there is uh, room for you at, at the table. Next slide. Uh, if you're wondering where Siskiyou County is, uh, it's in a very rural uh, portion at the very top of uh, California. The population of our largest city, Wairika, California, the county seat, is 7,500 people. So uh, very rural overall. The population of our county as a whole is about 43,000 people. Next slide. So one thing we get from uh, a lot of our communities is uh, a lot of our, since our cities are sm so small, uh, we have to work with our uh, communities so that they can use some extra staff capacity to make sure that they can, um, we're, we're a small nonprofit. Uh, I'll go into some other things of how we work uh, overall, but as a, a small community, uh, we have to be able to um, uh, band together and use each other's experience. Uh, and as a whole, uh, the county, uh, the cities of Weed, Wairika, and Mount Shasta have all received brownfield funding uh, through assessment, through coalition, uh, through cleanup and through multi-purpose uh, grant avenues. And the numbers I'm giving here are for the city of Wairika. Uh, we received a, a return on investment of about 100 to 1 uh, for every $1 uh, grant uh, in dollar invested. Uh, the annual, annual uh, economic impacts are about 300% uh, the amount of uh, annual revenue that the city of Wairika uh, gets. And then the overall jobs created, uh, we created about 150 jobs out of this assessment project. And just to give you just an overall appreciation of how much brownfield uh, assessment funding can do for a community, it has some, some huge uh, economic gains overall. Next slide, please. So a little bit about our organization. We're a nonprofit, and about a third uh, of our budget comes from our local communities. So uh, our local cities, we have nine local jurisdictions and then the county. Uh, they all uh, support us, and then we use that money to leverage and apply for larger grants, such as the Brownfield Grant, and we can use our technical assistance and our um, staff capacity to then be able to help each of our cities uh, be able to um, uh, engage opportunities that they normally wouldn't have the staff capacity to apply for. Uh, so we serve in this role. And our, our main role uh, in economic development is really to help businesses thrive and create vibrant economies. Uh, our first um, exposure with uh, the EPA uh, goes back to uh, 1998, uh, helping out the city of Mount Shasta. Next slide, please. And understanding economic development, uh, economic development is a, um, a fundamental aspect, even in rural communities. Uh, basic, uh, basically, the idea is that you have a certain limited amount of resources, even uh, very uh, urban areas with uh, relatively greater amount of resources, uh, still need to allocate those resources in a way that helps uh, community vitality and helps community revitalization as a whole. So we invest those limited resources in a way to actually improve uh, everything going forward. Next slide, please. Uh, so it, it's really important when you're writing these grants to, I'm getting some feedback. Is anybody else getting that feedback? Nope, okay. Uh, so it's really important to incorporate uh, stakeholders into the group. Uh, so you're not only writing uh, these grants to represent uh, your local cities, 
uh, your government staff, um, and also the uh, local businesses and the private investment on the developers and the public, or your local tribes, whoever you may be. But you're also uh, making sure that you represent uh, the values of what the EPA and the, the strategies that the EPA has lined out, as well as your local, uh, our lo my local in uh, Region 9 is the California State Department of Toxic Substance Control, uh, and making sure that you incorporate all these different stakeholders into your grant application. Uh, a lot of times what people don't know is that the EPA and the uh, your, your state um, uh, departments can actually help with technical assistance in addition to TAB and in addition to um, the Center for Creative Land Recycling as well can help with that um, and include and help you engage those stakeholders. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is an example of uh, a property inventory that we developed with our first uh, Brownfield Assessment Grant for the city of Wairika. Uh, the city is spread out along an interstate, so it's very long. Uh, we have a long history of timber mills in the area, and a lot of these timber mills have um, gone away, really, with the um, uh, changing in uh, the economic uh, uh, dynamics. Our, our property our the overall is about 60% uh, public lands within Siskiyou County, and as public lands um, and management practices change, uh, so did our economy. We also have, since we're along the interstate there, we have a lot of old um, uh, fueling station, automotive fueling stations and the like. So we had a lot of opportunity, a lot of uh, candidate sites for uh, Brownfield. And so uh, really uh, writing the application, it was good to be able to reach out to the community and uh, those uh, uh, wise folks that have been here a, a very long time um, uh, that they can actually give us some information on, on likely sites that, hey, this used to be a gas station, hey, this used to be a timber mill, and not have to go through and do um, a lot of paperwork to know which sites are the best candidate sites before going into depth and creating a fancy map like this and, and doing the assessment. So when you're applying, it is, of course, very important to know where your candidate sites are and then to be able to describe uh, the breadth of the problem in your community. Next slide, please. And really, it's one of the, the fun things to be able to describe some of our experience. Um, like I mentioned, um, we've been fortunate enough to receive uh, several different assessments, uh, cleanup, and uh, coalition assessment grants. Uh, so really trying to tell our story of, of um, when we write a grant application, it's trying to communicate to the grant reviewers uh, what efforts we have been doing, uh, what our history is, and, and what actually uh, started the candidate sites, what the problems were, and then uh, what our focus is for removing the barriers. Uh, business and developers really hate uncertainty. Uh, banks also, for financing these projects, really uh, hate uncertainty. And so the, the really big uh, piece of the puzzle that the EPA and the DTSC, our state uh, environmental quality uh, regulator provide is by doing the assessment on these properties we can remove that uncertainty and so that we can tell businesses or developers exactly how much it will cost to uh, clean up and then to develop uh, these sites. Um, with uh, a lot of other leveraging ends up uh, making sure that we can um, take advantage of current infrastructure or other infrastructure projects. Uh, we have a few grant projects out there. The state of California is investing heavily in electric vehicle charging stations, and so we can work that in to help facilitate the EPA's uh, strategies as far as sustainable uh, and smart growth in communities. Um, we're collaborating with workforce needs with the community college employment training panels uh, and other grants uh, and uh, services that are available in our community to try and help train. We haven't received a training grant yet, but we know that they're available and we're working towards uh, getting that uh, and leveraging those projects. Uh, we also have, uh, we're transitioning from tourism, timber to tourism. Uh, we've uh, been able to leverage some financial districts and that sort of thing. So it, every little bit of money helps leverage some of these uh, projects and being able to uh, move things forward because if it's just brownfield funding, it can be hard uh, in your application to say that you're you're going to leverage all these different things to actually uh, work forward going, going forward. Uh, one thing I will say is that with the leveraging, uh, when we originally started, if you're having a hard time uh, actually completing an application um, and if it feels overwhelming to fill out the, the entire application task, we reached out to a local community foundation, a private foundation, and then also 
uh, community development block grants to help do some feasibility and help do some of the groundwork to identify inventory properties, to reach out to landowners, to be able to talk to the, the cities and educate some of the city councils and that sort of thing to actually pass a resolution to apply for this and to actually get all the stakeholders on board so when you do make an application, you do, it, you do so as a united front and you're well informed on the health impacts of the likely candidate properties and that sort of thing. Next slide. So one thing that we have uh, received in the past as far as challenges and identified challenges, uh, when you're filling out a lot of the paperwork with the applications, it's really important to understand the basic threshold criteria, whether your candidate sites are actually allowable under the ETA rules. Uh, also knowing that if you have identified a candidate site and it does pass the threshold criteria, do you have permission of that private landowner to actually uh, go on and actually do those assessments, right? Or if they even qualify uh, under that threshold criteria. And then of course, identifying the inventory, that uh, making sure that uh, whatever inventory, whatever candidate sites that you have, do meet uh, the threshold criteria, do meet uh, the permission basis, whether it's publicly owned or privately owned, and also fit into the ideal inventory and meet some of those strategic goals that the EPA outlines for developing those brownfield properties. Next slide, please. So uh, really to bring this all together, um, reducing uncertainty really helps drive private investment. Uh, the better that you can characterize a property, uh, the better you can put a distinct price point and a time period of how long it will take and how much it will cost, uh, you're much more likely to get private investment. Uh, leveraging those infrastructure, a lot of brownfields already have sewer, water, electrical, sidewalks, street lamps. Uh, they're just usually blighted uh, lots for the most part. And so making sure you leverage the existing infrastructure that's already there, and then a developer will see that is that property being on sale. They don't even have to do a lot of the uh, infrastructure building that they would on a greenfield or somewhere in a suburb outside of town. Now leveraging of their funding, like I mentioned before, if you have other grants, if you have a green space, if you have you know water conservation projects, if you have other infrastructure funding, if you have any other funding that you can, try to make sure that that is characterized in your grant application so it shows that you're working towards uh, your general plan and that the city is moving in a strategic way forward and the brownfield is just a piece of that larger strategy. Uh, one thing that is really uh, wonderful that we've gained out of all of our different uh, brownfield applications and then also managing uh, those uh, brownfield grants and managing environmental consultants is we've really learned how brownfields are managed. We've learned a lot of the uh, analysis of brownfield cleanup alternatives. We've learned you know, what's the most expensive, what's the least expensive, what's the best for each uh, type of property, whether you're going to develop it into a green space or whether it's going to be a business park or light industry. And then uh, finally, um, it's communicating that story so the public knows what you're doing, uh, you're not doing it in a vacuum, and then being able to tell your story to the EPA uh, and to the grant review committee, uh, making sure that you characterize. Um, it's not as important to clarify if, if you have, uh, say, some health impacts. You can describe general larger health impacts. Uh, not a lot of people actually have the, the detailed data. It's usually the most often question I get on telling a story of how do you characterize health impacts of brownfields if you don't have the data? Uh, which we try in our applications to try to tell the, de the general story to make sure that it's characterized and say the potential impacts of the type of brownfields that you have based off of other research that's done. Next slide, please. And uh, the last thing really is to, to make sure that you use the assistance that's available, both TAB, uh, the EPA, and then uh, also the Center for Creative Land Recycling. Depending on what region you're in, there is technical assistance available, uh, and that'll be discussed later on in this webinar. So please pay attention to that, because that uh, that's a, a free way to actually make sure that you can double check if things are going the way they are um, and, go, and improving overall. Uh, follow up with your stakeholders often and make sure that you um, leverage that infrastructure planning funding so you know what is coming next. After you do the brownfield assessment, what's the next thing to come? And then to maximize uh, the amount of funding that you're able to use for assessment and cleanup, funding for performance. If you're spending it all on management or paperwork, uh, you're not going to get very much done. It's not going to look, look good in the eyes of the public or in, in the funding side. So make sure that you focus on uh, the end goal of all of this. Next slide. And that is all I have. Okay. Thank you, Logan. Our next speaker is Ann Wallace. And for those who don't know what TBA stands for in that previous slide, it stands for Targeted Brownfields Assessments, which are available from, available from your regional office. So Ann, take it away. 
Great, thank you, and good morning or afternoon to everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you all this afternoon. I'm going to talk about brownfields uh, from the urban perspective, as, as Logan talked about it from the uh, somewhat uh, rural perspective. Next slide, please. So Knoxville, Tennessee is located in the eastern portion of the state of Tennessee. You can see it here uh, in the map of the U.S. And uh, we are uh, located strategically in about an eight hours drive of half of the country, which is really um, exciting in terms of opportunities and um, uh, growth potential for the city. Uh, we're currently at about 184,000 population and our county is just under 500,000, but we do anticipate continuing to grow over the next several years. And as a strategic part of that growth experience, we're looking to revitalize properties within the core of the city. Next slide, please. So our vision for brownfield redevelopment is really trying to strategically bring vitality and livability back to uh, these areas that have had negative influences from blighted or, or vacant properties that may or may not have environmental contamination as um, that is sort of the definition of a brownfield is either real or perceived contamination. Um, and so we want to really take these properties from economic decline and create safe, secure, healthy neighborhoods where mixed use development thrives, really bringing back a sense of community to areas where um, there has been disinvestment. Uh, so with that, we uh, strategically applied for a 2009 area-wide assessment grant for the South Waterfront. And we were able to receive a $400,000 grant for petroleum and hazardous assessment. We then uh, tied a second grant to that grant um, with the downtown north area for another 400,000 for petroleum and hazardous assessments. And we'll look at those locations on the, on the next slide. But um, we were also able to work with EPA Region 4 and get a targeted brownfield assessment for a specific piece of property, the McClung Warehouses on the northern end of our downtown. And then finally, we've applied for and were successful in receiving um, cleanup grants for the sanitary laundry property in downtown north and the McClung warehouses. And those were funded at 200,000 from EPA with a 40,000 local match and then 150,000 and 30,000 local match. Uh, next slide, please. So as we've been looking at our core of the city and um, what you can see in the blue and purple areas um, in the center of this image is um, the core of downtown. Um, we've been strategically working with a focus on downtown and then the outer ring neighborhoods. And you'll see the south waterfront um, is a very large area on the southern side of the Tennessee River. And then our downtown north corridor is uh, sort of the boot shape uh, to the north of the Jackson Depot area where the McClung Warehouses is located. Next slide, please. So with these grants, we've been able to um, accomplish all of the field work that was necessary, um, provide the finalized reports to EPA for the assessment grants in 2014. And all of that data has been entered into the ACRES database, uh, which is helpful because that database is available to Congress and others um, to assess what these grants has, have been able to accomplish. Um, we did work with consultants. Uh, we were able to utilize uh, professional services contracts for grant writing, and then we also used um, consultants to perform the assessment grants for us. And we worked with SNME, a very reputable company, and one we've enjoyed working with. They're going to be keeping those records for seven years for us from the completion of the assessment grant. And as part of that grant, we did utilize um, four disadvantaged businesses, and that is both helpful um, for EPA's uh, reporting purposes, but also for the city of Knoxville. It was strategic to our department to make sure that we were including um, disadvantaged businesses, including women-owned and minority-owned businesses for this grant work. And then because of the um, ability to accomplish these grants, we were invited to share the information at various conferences in multiple states. And from the assessment grant success, we were able to leverage the targeted brownfield assessment grant uh, and then also the two cleanup grants uh, for specific properties that the city now owns. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> as you're thinking about planning um, for an ARC grant, one of the key things is to make sure that you're looking at um, 
areas where you've already had studies and plans that have been conducted, we actually started looking at the South Waterfront in 2006 and did a very large master planning process for that area. And we started doing planning work for the downtown north area in 2008. So you can see that um, strategically utilizing existing plans have really set the stage for success by partnering these grants with other efforts that are already ongoing. Um, as you're building your grant, you'll want to use information from the American Community Survey for statistical information. And I think it's important to note that um, while uh, you're writing your grant, you want to make sure that you explain the need. And sometimes that need look, needs to be presented pretty desperately. Um, so make sure that you highlight um, what's not going well so the EPA and, and the reviewers understand why this grant would be critical for the success of the community. Additionally, uh, looking at census data and other reports to support the community need is very uh, important. And then making sure that you're responding to the questions that EPA presents um, and identifying the need and how those resources will be used to meet the need is critical to a successful grant writing process. Next slide, please. With that said, um, as we talked about having um, working on areas where you've already done planning, um, strategic partnerships tend to develop through those processes. And one of the key things that we found was having those relationships and a common set of goals established, um, even prior to applying for your grant, is very helpful because when people or when you go to individuals or, or agencies to request letters of support, they already know what your goal is and um, how their role can assist you. Some of the key agencies and, and folks that we've worked with for the city of Knoxville is um, Tennessee's Department of Environment and Conservation, our state agency for the environment, uh, Community Development Corporation for the city of Knoxville, our Industrial Development Board, lots of different neighborhood organizations as well as business and professional associations. Uh, the Community Design Center was very helpful in um, writing a letter of support. And then actually one of the churches in the downtown north area has offered to host public meetings throughout the duration of our grants. And so that was a strategic partnership that we were able to take advantage of. Um, also working with other nonprofits or even your health department can help quantify your need and also help show to EPA that you're working in concert with the folks who are going to be directly impacted by these grants. Next slide, please. So again, as um, Logan talked about, the idea of leveraging is critically important um, to both EPA and also to cities as we strategically utilize taxpayer dollars to um, uh, fund these efforts and, and to move properties forward successfully. EPA notes that on average for every dollar spent on a brownfield grant, it yields $18 of private investment. Um, the city of Knoxville has a specific project where uh, in the south waterfront we had a former hospital that was sitting vacant and um, it is in a redevelopment area, the south waterfront redevelopment area. And by utilizing a brownfield grant, new zoning ordinance, and public improvements, we were able to leverage $165 million private investment on this former 23-acre hospital site. With that said, we used about 150,000 of our South Waterfront Assessment Grants to do Phase 1 and Phase 2 uh, environmental site assessments for the project, and also to do lead-based paint and asbestos surveys, um, which really set the stage for the developer to come to us and say, hey, we know what we're buying when we buy this site. We're interested in working with TDEC on getting a voluntary brownfield agreement in place before we purchase the property. And with that said, we were able to see an $1,100 return for every EPA dollar invested for that site. And with the next several slides, we'll look at sort of the site specific and how that looks. So next slide, please. So here you can see um, between Henley Street Bridge and Blunt Avenue and the Gay Street Bridge to the right of the screen, the former hospital property um, associated with the former Baptist Hospital site. And the buildings highlighted in yellow um, were all scheduled for demolition as part of this grant uh, or as part of the redevelopment of the site. But prior to that demolition, um, in the next slide, you'll see uh, the work being done for lead-based paint and asbestos removal. So next slide, please. And here you can see um, work being done on the interior of the building with regards to this asbestos-wrapped pipes. And if you'll click the image again. 
Here you can see uh, workers uh, quarantining uh, the area for that asbestos abatement and for also um, dealing with the lead-based paint. Next slide. One of the exciting parts about the Baptist Hospital demolition and the way that the um, uh, team that was doing the work uh, decided to work through the environmental issues was that they also uh, chose to um, recycle the um, concrete material once the structures had been cleaned and, and certified as um, having the other elements removed. And so they actually crunched the um, concrete uh, and material into recyclable concrete for uh, use in roadway projects and other areas that might need that type of uh, base stone material uh, to be able to build up from. Next slide, please. And so after about two years of demolition, we are actually starting to see the new development come out of the ground. And you can see the site um, under construction here. They're installing a new parking garage and um, 300 units of luxury apartment complex. Uh, there's also the new headquarters for Regal Cinema being located on this site in a former medical office building tower. And then there will also be a component for student housing um, and so forth on the west side of the Henley Street Bridge, the bridge that you see. Uh, off uh, to the left of this image. So it's really exciting that this project has um, really come to fruition, and part of that was the key to knowing the liability and the issues associated with the brownfield condition of the property uh, prior to the developers purchasing the site. So next slide, please. And what we noted uh, in our work with EPA and with TDEC and with private developers is that success yields success. By completing the assessments grants, we were able to set the stage for re reinvestment and excuse me, and additional grant awards. And EPA likes to see progression from assessment to cleanup or to revolving loan funds or other successful programs so that they can see that their dollars are going as far as possible. Next slide, please. So finally, the last few items are some takeaway points that we learned from going through our grant writing process. Um, we, we started early. We um, began investigating the possibility of uh, submitting for grants about three to six months out before applications were due. Um, and you might hesitate to do that, but I would encourage you to at least begin thinking and planning, figuring out who your strategic partners might be uh, in order to be able to uh, pinpoint resources and, and talk to those potential partners before the grant applications are due. And in doing so, if you take the opportunity to review previous successful applications, it's a great way to kind of start understanding what you need for your community to be able to put together a great um, grant application. For the city of Knoxville, we identified roles and responsibilities. Um, internally, we uh, reached out to our engineering department, our purchasing uh, department, community development, and also the law department. And the law, de law department was actually very strategic in our ability to be successful because they drafted right of entry forms that we were able to present to the private property owners in order for us to be able to gain access to those properties. Um, and then also, do you need consultants to assist with grant writing or data collection? We, uh, again, use the professional services of SNME to write our grants um, and it was very helpful to us uh, because they had a lot of experience in writing those grants and knowing what data to look for and who to ask questions for in terms of that data. And again, talk to your state representatives early and often. They're great assistant and they have a lot of experience with these programs and know the ins and outs. Um, as Logan mentioned, you'll want to participate in the webinars and trainings offered by EPA or the TAB um, providers. And then make sure that you familiarize yourself with the websites associated with the grant so that you're not surprised by questions or information that you might need to provide. And then um, one of the things I can say from personal experience is um, Uploading early is a really great idea. Um, we found an error in one of our applications and we were able to resubmit because we chose to upload about three days before um, the final grant application was due and so we were able to get it squared away uh, before the final um, application was due. And then finally, make sure that you highlight your success and share it with everybody. Um, it's great to hear uh, good news. And so um, the city of Knoxville has been very excited to participate in the ARC grants, and we've really enjoyed it. And so with that, I'll turn it back over to Ignacio. Thank you.
Yeah, and there was a question for you uh, regarding the uh, lead in asbestos survey, I believe. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, who funded the demolition of the hospital after asbestos was removed? Okay, that um, the demolition was fully funded by the private developer, um, but that was after they had received the voluntary brownfield agreement with the state before they purchased the property. So um, the state put together a um, program for how the asbestos and lead-based paint was to be removed during or before the demolition started. Thank you. Now, uh, Anne points out a few tips here, and we have a few polling questions for the audience. So the uh, question is, have you ever submitted an art grant? So roughly 50-50, a bit more, have not. Um, actually, no is gaining ground. So it's about a 55-45 split with 55 not having submitted. And, uh, and our next question is, If you submit a, if you actually submit a grant, how many hours do you typically allocate to preparing an application? All right, we have uh, uh, just about a third voting so far. Uh, we'll wait a couple more seconds. I guess. All right, uh, let's share. The results, uh, a, plural, a plurality of you actually spend over 60 hours and the rest 40 to 60 hours with a few folks really not, in our opinion, not taking enough time. So those are quite revealing. And last question uh, for the meantime is, let's see, uh, How far in advance do you prepare your art grant application? All right, we're going to close it now. We uh, vast majority uh, work uh, six weeks before uh, and more, so that's encouraging. Uh, you guys are doing the right thing. So our next speaker is Steve uh, Lefevre, and Steve, take it away. Okay, well thank you, Ignacio, and um, good morning or good, good afternoon, everyone, and I'd like to also uh, state my appreciation for being asked to be on this panel, and I uh, certainly uh, appreciate the opportunity. Um, next slide, please. So. I work for an engineering firm by the name of Barton and LeJudis, and we are a multidisciplined engineering firm um, that was established in 1961. Uh, we are headquartered in Syracuse, New York, but we also have offices uh, in other areas of New York as well as uh, Pennsylvania and Maryland. We consist of about 220 staff, uh, about one-fourth of whom are um, licensed professional engineers. But as you can see in this slide, we also have uh, many other professionals that, that really make this a great a great place to work. Next slide, please. And I have made available uh, for download a, a brochure of, uh, of our company. Um, I'm not going to read each one of these bullets to you, but I just want to let you know that uh, Barton LeJudis has the necessary professionals and expertise to cover a wide range of uh, environmental needs. Um, that we provide to both the municipal and public sector, um, I'm sorry, the municipal and private sector. However, I'd say 80 to 85 percent of our clients are, are public sector clients. Um, but as far as the, these services relate to brownfields, especially when you get into the, uh, the remediation end of things, certainly some of these services uh, are, are of value. Next slide, please. So I first became introduced to the um, EPA uh, Brownfields grant program 
uh, back in 2008. I had, uh, in 2007, we were retained by the city of Rome. New York City of Rome is located about 45 minutes east of uh, Syracuse, New York, on the New York State Thruway. And we were retained by the city of Rome to conduct um, remedial investigations on five city-owned um, brownfield sites. And the city had obtained a, uh, a grant from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, which paid for 90% of the costs to investigate uh, and, and clean up these sites. And in addition, the city had applied to the EPA for a brownfield assessment grant, uh, and they were awarded $200,000. So uh, as the uh, project manager, I became familiar with the EPA brownfields program, and I, I was quite intrigued by it. And it seemed like, uh, you know, I got to know some of the uh, EPA Brownfield project managers in the uh, New York City office, which is Region 2, and uh, became very intrigued by the program. And I suggested to my supervisor and some of my colleagues that we consider applying for grants for, uh, you know, for some of our clients. So in, two, in the fall of 2009, we applied for four grants. We applied for on behalf of the city of Ogdensburg, we applied for a uh, $200,000 cleanup grant and a $1 million revolving loan fund grant. We applied for a $400,000 grant for the city of Auburn, $200,000 for petroleum and $200,000 for hazardous. And we applied for a $200,000 cleanup grant for the, the village of Camden. And we were awarded all four grants. And as my supervisor said, uh, we hit a grand slam. And uh, it was really a, a, a neat and invigorating feeling. And something that's important for, I think, for everyone to, to know, um, I initially thought that the EPA grants would only be awarded to, to large municipalities, say like a, like a Knoxville, Tennessee. But in fact, um, the city of Ogdensburg has a population of a little over 1,000 people. And it's located in a pretty remote part of New York State. It's located on the St. Lawrence River uh, near the Canadian border. Um, the city of Auburn has a population of about 27,000. The village of Camden has a population of little over 2,000. And then um, the city of, uh, the city of, let's see, yeah, so those three cities. So, you know, I guess the point is that, you know, small municipalities um, have just as, just as much, uh, potential to get a grant from the EPA as the larger municipalities do, and I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, we then went ahead and uh, the following year we applied for a cleanup grant for the city of Rome uh, for one of the sites that we had used the uh, EPA assessment grant funds on, and we were awarded a, a cleanup grant. And so that goes to the point that some of the other speakers have made is that once you, the EPA awards you a grant, if they award you an assessment grant, and if you do a good job of managing the money and allocate spending down the money and, and you know providing uh, good results to them, they are going to be very likely to provide you with additional grants. And I think that's and that's that's another great thing about about the EPA and about this program. Um, we continue to apply for the grants, but the grants became more difficult to. And the reason being is that because I think more municipalities across the entire United States, um, maybe because of reductions in state funding uh, for the assessment and cleanup brownfield sites, and also maybe just because the word got around that the EPA grant program was, so, was such a good deal, uh, became more competitive. And so what happens is the, the EPA, when you submit a grant proposal, the EPA uh, has typically, it used to be three reviewers. It might be now that they only have two reviewers. And these reviewers um, are not located generally in your region. So for instance, someone out in say the Midwest is probably going to be reviewing a grant proposal from, for a, a site in New York. But what happens is they, everyone scores the grants according to the criteria that's laid out when the RFP is issued. And then the reviewers compare their notes. If there's a large discrepancy between scores, they have a conference call to, to go over those discrepancies and to resolve them, but they then end up scoring your proposal. And when we first started um, preparing these grant proposals, if you, let's say for an assessment grant proposal, if you scored, say, in the mid-80s, then you were, awarded, you were awarded the grant. Now it's about 10 points higher. Now you have to get 
close to 95 or 96 percent, you know, percent correct um, in order to get a grant. So it's become highly, highly competitive. And I'm going to talk some more about how to uh, make sure your grant is as successful as it can be shortly here. But um, it's just become very, very competitive. However, having said that, and, and I have prepared some grant proposals that were not approved. Um, one thing that you want to do is don't a don't be discouraged, um, and make sure that you ask for a debriefing from your uh, from the EPA Brownfield project manager. They will sit down with you and go over your proposal and give you a detailed debriefing. And if you take to heart everything that they say, uh, chances are if you decide to reapply the next year, you're going to you're going to get that grant. And that's what happened with us with the city of Kingston. Um, the first year I submitted a, a grant proposal for the city of Kingston, we we just missed, uh, and then we took you know we prepared a stronger grant proposal the following year, and we we were awarded the work. So um, it's it's you know basically don't don't give up. Um, so here's a listing of all the grants that we've gotten. The one grant that we got for the city of Glens Falls was a was a coalition grant, and I know coalition grants were were mentioned previously. A coalition grant is a really great way for uh, really small municipalities that might not have the the, the staff um, to to manage a grant to team up with other smaller municipalities and then to, to all submit together. So for the city of Glens Falls, there were actually seven uh, municipalities that formed a coalition, and then the city of Glens Falls acted as the lead grantee. And you, they were awarded six hundred thousand dollars. And I've heard, uh, you know, some of the EPA Brownfields project managers say that they really like to award coalition grants because it gives some of the really smaller municipalities that have viable brownfield sites a, a, an opportunity to be part of the program. The last uh, grant that's written, uh, that's listed here for City of Glens Falls, is, and I won't talk a lot about it, but just so you can see what the acronym, it's a, and it's an environmental workforce job training grant. So the EPA also issues uh, grants to municipalities that if you want to um, provide training classes to unemployed and underemployed individuals um, that enable them to be able to get hired by the uh, environmental contractors, uh, that's the purpose of the program. So there are some required core courses such as the, the uh, HAZWAP or 40-hour course, if you're familiar with that. Uh, the confined space course, um, lead and asbestos uh, sampling and, and abatement classes, and et cetera. So that's another type of grant that BNL has uh, prepared successfully on behalf of our municipal clients. Um, next slide, please. So you've already heard some really, really great, great tips. Um, and in fact, I mean, I. You know, some of the tips that Ann mentioned were, uh, I, I, you know, feel the same way and I would echo. And I, I don't think there's too much repeat with what I'm going to say, but, um, and these are based on, these tips are based on me, my having written probably 12, 12 to 15 EPA grant proposals um, and going every year, going to the workshops that the EPA Region 2 um, staff give um, and to, just looking, getting feedback. And one of the things that I learned to do early on was um, was to, I felt it was very helpful and very valuable to obtain copies of successful EPA Brownfield grant proposals uh, that had already, you know, that had been submitted and awarded. And in fact, um, now there's a mechanism where you can, you'll hear about this later, but you can go on to the KSU website uh, and actually download successful grant proposals. But I actually, I think this was back in 2011 or 12, maybe. I actually contacted some municipalities down in, in Florida, uh, and they were nice enough to provide me with uh, copies of their of their grant proposals as well as their uh, some of their letters of community letters of support. So, if you're thinking about preparing a, a grant proposal and you've never done one, or if you've prepared one before and submitted it and weren't successful, I would highly recommend that you obtain a, several copies of successful proposals and review them. Um, 
similar to what to what Ann said, um, I think you really need to decide very early on um, if if you are going to submit. You want to get your uh, your partners together. Um, you want to make sure that you have your community-based organizations um, ready to to help you out. Um, and you really just want to you want to be prepared and you want to start early to to pull that proposal together. And at the same time, you want to decide whether or not you have the the necessary resources internally. Um, you know, do you have grant writers? If you're a municipality, do you have full-time grant writers that are going to be capable of of preparing this proposal, or do you think you want to, uh, you know, ha retain, use the services of a professional consultant to help you? Um, I, I will say that the, you know, and we, Barton and LeJudas prepares a lot of grants for our municipal clients, but Brown, EPA Brownfield grant proposals are very, very unique. Um, and I really think that having uh, an environmental professional, especially one who's worked on an EPA Brownfield grant is, is, is invaluable. So. Uh, I would encourage you to, if you have the funding, um, to try to uh, have a, a consultant assist you. And, and you know, the way that we approach it at Barton and Judas is that I will tell the municipality, first of all, A, it's going to be a collaborative effort. I'm going to need your input. I'm going to need you to help me out in, in gathering some of the information that's going to go into the proposal. But B, I can do as little or as much as you want. So if you need me to do a lot of the lifting, that's fine. I, I'm more than happy to do that. But if you want to do the brunt of the work and then just have me, you know, help you out and just by doing some reviews and doing some other things, that's fine as well. So that's just something to uh, to keep in mind. Um, when preparing the grant proposal, assume that the reviewer knows nothing about about your municipality uh, or or if it's for a site. And this goes back to the fact that let's say if, if you know I'm submitting a proposal for the city of Rome in, in central New York and the reviewer is from you know Iowa or Kansas well maybe they've never been to New York before or they don't know about what central you know a lot of people you mentioned New York they think of New York City well maybe they don't know what central New York is like um, so you really have to assume that the reviewer knows nothing about your your area and it's it's even more difficult, in my opinion, when you aren't allowed to use any maps or graphics. Okay, the DPA does not allow you to do that. So as as Ann put up a, a you know a map before showing where Knoxville is, well, you're not allowed to do that in your proposal. So that's something to to keep in mind. Next slide, please. Very important. When, you know, you need to address all of the criteria that's stated in the RFP that the EPA issues. And you don't need to wait until the EPA issues, let's say you don't need to wait until the EPA issues their RFP for funding for federal year 2018. You can go on to the EPA website right now and you can download the RFPs for that were issued for last year. Chances are they're not going to change a lot as far as the information that, the, that they're going to request or the number of points that they're going to assign to each of the categories. So you want to go ahead and, and do that, I would say do that now, and you, may, you have to make sure that you address all of the criteria, even if a criteria doesn't apply for whatever reason to your proposal, you actually need to state in a sentence, this criteria does not apply, because the reviewers, if you miss a point here and a point there, and before you know it, you may have missed enough points that you're going to slip underneath the, the threshold that the EPA establishes each year to determine how many grant proposals they're going to, they're going to award. And what they do is, is they take the available funding that they have, that, they've been, that Congress has allocated, and then they have to figure out what score can they use as a cutoff that will allow them to you know, give out all the grant money that, they've, that they have. So... It's really important to address all of the criteria. Um, tell a very sad story about your community. And this was something that um, one of the EPA project managers in, in the New York City office told me. Uh, and he says that every year he gives, a, he gives a workshop and he's like, make me cry. You know, I want to cry. I mean, so in other words, this isn't like you're, something that the Tourism Bureau would write for your, you know, for your county or your municipality. It's, it's the opposite. You really want to paint a bleak picture 
about the and the impact that these brownfield sites are having on the quality of life that the people living adjacent to them, how they're suffering, how unemployment is very high, how people are living at or below the poverty poverty level. Uh, just you really just want to really stress uh, how bad things are in your in your community. You want to focus on a human interest story or theme that makes a grant proposal unique. So for the city of Glens Falls, and I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but um, the, the Hudson River, which flows right adjacent to the city of Glens Falls, uh, was contaminated with PCBs from a, a General Electric site. And in fact, the Hudson River was the largest, the dredging of the Hudson River and the PCB contamination was the largest Superfund site in the US. Well, you want to make sure that you say that in your proposal. You want to make sure that you let the reader know, look, these are the circumstances. These are the things that are happening around us. These are the, the mills that have closed, uh, you know, the automobile manufacturers that have left town. These are all the derelict properties, the abandoned factories and mills that we have. This is, this is why we need your, this EPA grant funding to either do site assessments or do the cleanups. You really have to, you really have to relate it to specific, specific information. Be as specific as possible. Keep your story clear and consistent. And and Anne, I think touched upon this before, but you really, and this is something that I've I've lost points on before. You have to identify what the problem is. So in other words, let's say, well, we don't have enough elderly housing in the city. Well, how are you going to use EPA grant funding to help you take care of that? Well, we're going to clean up some this old industrial site, or we're going to clean up these these brownfield sites, and we're going to redevelop them into housing for the elderly and for the senior citizens. You need to carry your story all the way through in your proposal. You need to show how you're going to get from point A to point B. And it's all about the EPA uses the words of, you know, outputs and outcomes. So you want to make sure that you really that you really do that. Next slide, please. Okay, so you want to, you need to identify, there's certain sections where you really want to identify um, what are the sensitive populations in the target community. Do you have an environmental justice area or areas in your community? If you do, you definitely want to emphasize that in your, on your grant proposal. But, you know, when you have to do, there's certain tables where you have to talk about uh, how, are the, how are the brownfield sites impacting the, uh, the sensitive population. So you want to be able to say that. This, of, of all the people living in our target community, X percent are consist of, you know, children, or X percent consist of families with only one uh, parent, or X percent consist of, you know, people under the age of so and so. You really want to, you know, point that out and, and make a strong emphasis of that. Um, the other thing, and this is a little bit difficult to do, but you really you need to try to as best as possible include um, health health statistics in your proposal. Now, generally what I've done in the past is you can generally get health data for your state. You can probably get health data for your for your um, county, but it may or may not be so easy to get health data for your municipality. But what you can try to do is focus on census tracts or just try to find focus on whatever information you can. And you want to point out if there is if there are elevated blood level levels, if there's a higher incidences of asthma in the people living that within the target communities, if you know there's higher than normal cancer rates, uh, if there's people living in substandard housing, you know you really want to um, you really want to point out this information. And one of the sources I think Ann mentioned was the uh, America Community Surveys. I don't know if I'm saying that exactly right, but there's a lot of information on the internet that you can access. It takes a little time to do a little digging, but um, you can find this information, and I think it's really important to include in your proposal because it really helps to solidify and convince the reviewer um, that you need why you need this funding. The other thing you can do is if you don't have a lot of health data, is you can emphasize the social negatives. Um, you can t say, well, look, there's a high, there's a higher than normal rate of crime in the target community area where the brownfield sites are located. There's a higher, you know. There's illegal dumping going on. You can also indicate if you have the statistics that people have moved away from the area because um, of these derelict and blighted properties. You know what the EPA really wants is 
they want to take they want you to use your grant funding to improve the quality of life of the people that are living in proximity to these brownfield sites. So what does that mean? Well, for one thing, they want you to convince the people to keep living there, and they want to convince people to to infill the area. They want to convince the young professionals maybe to want to live, to move back into these areas and want to live there. So the EPA has really put a lot of emphasis on how are you going to make life better for the people that are living in proximity to these sites? And in my opinion, the EPA doesn't really care how contaminated the, the, the brownfield sites are. They care more about what are the results and the outcomes that you're going to be able to, what are you going to be able to achieve? Are you going to be able to achieve like what Knoxville did with your money? You know, are you going to be able to take a blighted piece of property that's not generating any tax revenue and put it back on the tax, you know, and create jobs and improve the quality of life for the people that are living near these areas. That's really what they, they want to see. Next slide, please. So again, um, you know, you really want to talk about, you want to try to, if possible, indicate how, uh, you know, how unemployment maybe has gone up due to the, due to the, um, you know, businesses moving out due to the fact that there's blighted properties uh, that are just sitting there that could be redeveloped into businesses. Um, there's also a, a part of the of the proposal where there's a other fact. It's called an other factors checklist, and you can indicate on there if you've had a large industry or a large manufacturer move out of town recently. Um, sometimes EPA, like if you're in a if you come if you're in a tie with another grant proposal as to who's going to get the funding. I've been told that sometimes the reviewers will look at these special factors, other factors checklist to help break that tie. So you definitely want to point out if, if you've had, um, you know, a lot of a high job loss in the area. Um, and you want to try to, as much as possible, provide quantitative information. Try to use statistics. Try to be as specific as possible because if you're too, if you're too general, um, it, it, the reviewer isn't going to, is, is essentially going to, take some points away. Um, and then the other thing which, which Ann touched on, and is, I agree wholeheartedly, is you want to obtain letters of commitment. Now, I highlighted letters of commitment because they used to be called letters of support. But now if you look in the RFP, they, they call them letters of commitment. And what does that mean? Well, instead of, instead of the YMCA saying, we support the city of Rome in their, in their application for assessment funds, they want, the EPA wants to say, how is this YMCA going to assist with assist the city of Rome if they were to get the grant? Are they going to provide a meeting space? Are they going to help advertise uh, the grant? So you really want to, and the, and the more letters that you can get from nonprofit groups, businesses, IDAs, churches, hospitals, senior citizen centers, colleges, et cetera, the better. The EPA, in my opinion, does not, they don't care if you get a letter from your local, from your senator or your congressman or, you know, politicians. They, and I've been told this by the EPA reviewers in Region 2, they don't care about that. They want to see the letters from the, the groups, the entities that are going to have, be impacted the most, the most by the grant being awarded to your community. Um, so I think that's the end of my presentation. Um, I guess if you, if, you, if you can't tell, I'm pretty passionate about the EPA Brownfield program. Um, I, I, I work very hard when I prepare a grant proposal on behalf of a, of a municipality. Um, and it's, it's, it's tough for me to have to wait the four to five months that it takes to uh, find out what the awards are. And it, I, I've had experienced, uh, had some very elated and uh, highs of highs when I found out that our grants had been awarded, and I, I always take it very personally and, and quite frankly, I'm pretty depressed when my, my grant isn't awarded that I've written. But that goes back to the point I made before. Um, please don't give up. If you can, please resubmit. And I'll get a debriefing from, your, uh, from the EPA, and, and please resubmit because chances are you're going to get uh, the grant the second time that you submit. So. With that, I am finished. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And we have three quick polling questions. And please uh, begin typing your questions in. And uh, so the first question, a uh, polling question is, 
if you are a public agency or nonprofit, have you retained a consultant to write your grant? And um, majority of folks uh, write their own grants. Apparently, it's a seven uh, uh, only thirty percent uh, hire consultants to write their grants. Next polling question is. Uh, do you have a second set of eyes review your grant application, whether it's your technical assistance to Brownfield's provider or your neighbor or your coworker? Well, uh, that's overwhelming. So the two percent there who said no, uh, get with it. And our third uh, polling question. If you were not uh, successful in receiving your ARC application, uh, did you have a debrief? All right, a uh, vast majority requested and got our debrief, and we highly recommend that. Uh, there are actually very painless uh, exercises, and uh, you certainly have to do it. So. Uh, we have actually uh, answered all our questions privately, and we don't have any questions coming in. So we are going tra to transition to our TAP providers, and which you know I will start. Uh, I'm with the Technical Assistance to Brownfield, uh, uh, the TAP grant, which is funded by the EPA, and uh, there are three of us. Uh, Kansas State University and New Jersey Institute of Technology are the other TAP providers. And uh, we provide free assistance uh, to state, tribal, regional government, nonprofits, and uh, and even other stakeholders who are working with these entities. Next slide. Uh, it's free assistance for planning, environmental, and economic development expertise. If we can't answer the question, we will find someone who can answer it for you. And we tailor our services to your needs. So we do a little things differently from each other. But we're there to help you any way we can, and we actually check in with each other if we can't answer your particular question. Uh, it's a very cooperative and cordial relationship, and we encourage everyone to reach out to their tab, and if not, they'll get you in touch with someone who can help you. There's no, up, no need to apply. Just give us a ring or an email. And what assistance we, we provide? Well, it runs the gamut. There's uh, direct technical assistance, one-on-one -on -one assistance with your communities. We can uh, do workshops uh, on any uh, on a variety of topics. We ed provide education on the brownfields redevelopment re redevelopment process. Uh, we help uh, connect you to other stakeholders, and uh, and, and such. So there's a variety. Please don't be shy. Uh, ask. Next slide. Uh, these are the types of webinars and seminars we have. Uh, Brownfields 101, grant writing workshops, meeting the funders, interagency working groups, which is essentially uh, getting together with your state and your regional uh, experts, uh, government agencies, and see how they can help you. Uh, and we also provide rural circuit writers. Uh, Again, a variety of services. We help with identifying and inventorying brownfields, visioning, which we will explain later, community outreach, uh, review of grant applications, uh, finding and evaluating environmental consultants. So we will we can provide you copies of uh, of uh, requests for proposals and help you evaluate those, and uh, many other services. And with those services come tools, which Blaze uh, Levin with uh, K-State will uh, now uh, explain to you. Blaze? Thanks, Ignacio, uh, and hello, everyone. I'll be talking again about the, these e-tools that are listed here on this slide and, and also a little bit of the other um, site-specific services we provide to help folks prepare and compete well for those ARC grants. So as far as the e-tools go, um, certainly our websites, each of the tabs websites are, are great resources. CClears and NJITs are particularly good, or one of the things they're good at for sure is, is they've got a good um, state resources directory showing listings of funding sources, 
federal and state funds. Uh, you know, if you're early in the process in identifying other funds to implement your redevelopment plans, that's a good place to look. Uh, and, and also for contacts with your state, as Ben talked about earlier, it's good to have uh, a good relationship with your state brownfields program and, and other funds in the, in the pipeline because EPA's funds are very important, but they're not going to, you know, pull, pull, and pull the whole weight uh, that you need to get things funded and redeveloped. KSU's website is where you go to find a couple of, of the web tools I'll be talking about next. Uh, one of them is called BIT, which stands for the Brownfields Inventory Tool, which is uh, a day-to-day -day kind of internal use uh, web-based program for any type of environmental site, but it's really key for use, using that for brownfields. And you can use this, these tools, you know, whether you have a grant or not, an EPA grant or not. Second tool, or the third tool, I guess, on the slide is, is called Tabby Z grant writing software, and you can use that to draft uh, your EPA assessment and cleanup proposals. Next slide. Okay, so a little bit about the Brownfields Inventory Tool. Uh, you use it to enter site data on uh, your, your prospective brownfields you, you may want to redevelop and uh, you enter information on the criteria that you've set in your community for revitalization or brownfields redevelopment. So some examples of those are set there or listed there. Um, property access, you know, by existing owners was one thing that was talked about that's really important. Uh, and then there may be some other things, you know, you're trying to accomplish in your community. So when you're entering information on various sites that might be ones you want to address, uh, you can easily sort and, and prioritize those sites to match them to your, your revitalization goals that are part of your normal planning process. Next slide. Next slide. Thanks. Uh, and a good thing about BIT is that you can really store everything in one place about your sites. Not only the, the information kind of in the middle panel there on, on the typical brownfield information, you know, about site assessments, cleanups, and redevelopment progress, but also photos, um, assessment reports that get done, you can upload those and, and they're all in one place. You can also generate simple maps. Uh, as you saw in some of our earlier speakers talked about, uh, you know, obviously they spent some time in inventorying and graphically displaying uh, information about that inventory. Um, and if you're successful in getting an EPA grant, you can report progress to EPA's ACRES database, which was also discussed. That's a grantee requirement, and there, it has an interface that goes you know, directly into that, that database. Next slide. Okay, well, you know, to, to match sites to redevelopment goals, you, you need to have redevelopment goals and, and even plans preliminary plans at least for your brownfields that you're requesting funding for. So that's something that needs to be done and that TAB can, can help you with. Um, and, uh, you know, we make sure, and it's important to make sure that that always in, is, is involving all stakeholders uh, in a way that you're soliciting input that's going to meet their economic, community, and environmental needs. That's really going to make redevelopment of that site successful. Next slide. An example of, of where TABs help do this is in Ottawa, Illinois, kind of a smaller town, uh, not too far from Chicago, but a ways from Chicago that uh, had an old glass manufacturing plant that dated back to the Civil War. Um, and uh, the city, as part of their normal planning process, convened a, a public input session, which, you know, included the public at large, but also business and uh, city officials, you know, all the stakeholders that were talked about earlier uh, that is, is important to get involved. Uh, and we had planners at that meeting, TAB facilitated that and had planning expertise at that meeting. And, and the, the input we took, we were able to uh, develop um, graphic renderings of, of kind of the most popular and most desired uh, reuse options, one of which was, you know, full demolition of all of the buildings on this site and, and cleaning things up to the extent that new residential could be put on there with maybe a green space interim use. Uh, and another option was partial demo of the older buildings 
uh, and maybe reused for either a community center or some sort of business or maybe multifamily housing. Uh, the full demo option required you know much more cleanup uh, than than the other option and so you know we captured that and did a preliminary economic analysis to see if you know both of those options were really feasible from kind of a market analysis standpoint and you know with that information you know with with kind of top reuse goals and also uh, you know funding requirements for getting things cleaned up as well as as for uh, you know, putting something new on this site, uh, this 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 community was really ready to compete well uh, with our grants. Next next slide. Okay, so you know when you're ready to write an art grant, and maybe you're not a total expert at it, uh, or even if you are, we do have experts use this tool as well. Uh, Tabby Z is a is a really good way to get started. Next slide. Uh, basically, you configure, you know, you indicate what type of application you're going to write. So in, in this case, I'm going to show you an example of, of a site-specific uh, assessment grant. Uh, so you click the buttons and you click the apply button and then next slide. Voila, you get a template to, with all the sections you need to write uh, to submit an application uh, for that type of funding. Okay, so, so, and there's basically a, a red, yellow, green light symbols to show, you know, which, which sections you've written in already or haven't started yet. Um, and when you click one of the sections to, to write in, next slide, you get, um, you know, a text box, which is kind of at the bottom of this, uh, of this slide, as well as the instructions from EPA's, um, application guidelines to show you exactly what you need to address for that particular section of your proposal. And as Steve said, it's, you know, this is a very prescriptive, uh, you know, writing these, these grants, you really have to write and respond to exactly what's being asked for every section. So this is a good way to, to see what, what is that exactly being asked. And there's also helpful hints, you know, kind of good secrets and other information provided by EPA. Um, there's also uh, kind of you can add comments to collaborators who are helping you write this grant and you know leave notes for them about different things. Uh, there's a character count that is recorded so that you can see how you're doing uh, you know on that 15 page uh, limit for this section and and those kinds of things. Next slide. And and, and basically, once you're finished drafting your, your proposal, you can export it to, to a MS Word file for, for additional formatting and review and, and, and finalization before you submit it in grants.gov. Uh, so you get to the, these, these tools, Tab Z and Bit, um, through our website, and you just mouse over the online tools and select either Bit or Tab Z. You do need to set up an account, um, and, and that's because your particular access is password protected and it's 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 uniquely yours next next slide um, and and furthermore that that information is not public uh, you can you as a user can share you know your stuff with collaborators you know individual collaborators but there's really not a way to make anything public um, the only way to make something a little bit public is if you're if you're moving some of your BIT data that maybe you're doing work on an EPA grant, you need to move some of the progress from BIT into acres. That's, you know, that data, once you move it into acres, is publicly available, but nothing in BIT is publicly available. I uh, already mentioned the, the helpful hints. Um, you can see that it is user-friendly. I think uh, folks will, will tell you that. And also, as was mentioned earlier, on our website and, and linked from Tabby Z are a lot of very useful resources for writing grants, including you know census statistics and and data, uh, really good information there, and past successful proposals you can download, um, all kinds of things that are very useful uh, at a, at a click, Avail you know very easy to access. Next slide. 
So in summary, um, you know, we, our, our e-tools and, and some of the site-specific planning and economic feasibility type work, community involvement type work we do, uh, can really help you submit a competitive proposal. And you know, whether we help you or, or not, it's really important to do that stuff. Um, there's one year there was a 77-way tie uh, at the cut point from the you know fund or not fund uh, decision point you know that EPA had when they were reviewing these things and and it's it's the proposals that are where it's clear that this work had been done you know months you know sometimes greater than six months I think the poll was saying certainly uh, you know those are the ones that are going to compete best and it, it's just that competitive nowadays. I want to remind you too that whether you use Tab EZ or not uh, or any of our services you can request review of grant applications uh, by, by uh, from Tab. Any one of the tabs have incredibly creative and experienced uh, grant writers and reviewers that do those reviews for you and provide a lot of good input. The key is to get drafts to us early, you know, not up against the deadline. We usually like one to two weeks notice, and you'll see some contacts here um, once, once the next speaker is done on how to get a hold of us if you don't know. So I will turn it over now to Elizabeth Limbrick, who is with NGIT tab, that will give you some more good advice and tips for doing those competitive proposals. Thank you so much, Blaze. So, sure. Um, again, I'm with the New Jersey Institute of Technologies tab team, and I've been asked to briefly provide you a few tips on writing ARC grants. And I think what you're going to hear in, is that a lot of the tips that I'm going to give you are um, echoing what you've already heard from some of the other speakers. So it kind of, you know, just really drives home to you just how important these are. Um, my first tip to you is that you need to develop a grant program that works for you and also appeals to EPA. You need to develop a specific focus to your grant program that is based on those unique needs of your community. As you heard earlier, generic does not get funded. You need to think about what is your story. It needs to be an intersection of the community needs and the project benefits for your community. You need to think about how will this project fix the problems that your community is facing. I think the most important takeaway, oh, I'm still on that previous slide. The most important takeaways that I can give you in terms of coming up with a successful grant application are number one, you need to earn every single point in the ranking criteria. You heard this earlier that the grants are very competitive. Last year's cutoff for the assessment grants was somewhere in the mid-190s out of 200 possible points. That means that getting an A is not enough. You need to get an A+. Plus. So again, like you heard earlier, make sure you don't skip anything. Make sure you get every single point you can. And number two is to know what the focus of your application is. Really know what's going to differentiate your application from the hundreds of others the EPA is going to see. Again, have a constant theme that runs throughout your application from that first section where it talks about community needs through the project description, through the budget, all the way through the project benefits. It all needs to tie together to tell a story and set your application, your community, and your project apart. Next slide. So here are just a few quick notes on tips and tricks. If you're submitting an assessment grant, first, identify a specific area that's in need of assessment. You need to have a focus. Have relevant participation and commitments from stakeholders. You know, really get that community involvement. The next one, and you've heard about this already, is about the property owners. You know, in the past, some awardees were not able to spend their grant money because they couldn't find any sites where the property owners would let them on the site to do the assessment. And that did not please EPA at all. <laughs> um, so this is really important. This is something they're really looking at. Um, if you can show that property owners are on board, you're going to be ahead of the game. And next, you want to target sites that have significant redevelopment or revitalization potential. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be economic. 
it could be a community space, but EPA really wants to fund projects that will be completed redevelopments. They don't want to just fund a bunch of assessments that go nowhere. And you've heard that earlier. Next slide. For cleanup grants, you want to target sites where, number one, you own the property and are not a responsible party. Now, that's a threshold requirement, so it kind of goes without saying, but I felt like I still had to say it. Um, these grants are really intended for shovel-ready sites. You will want to have a really good idea of what it's going to take to remediate the site when you submit your proposal. That means that sites that are fully characterized and where you have a solid remediation plan and cost estimate are going to be the most competitive. Now, EPA loves to see that they are not the only player or payer in the game. They want to see additional leveraged funds. And this is where a lot of people don't get the full points awarded. You need to get commitments from your project partners and developers, get some documentation, get this in writing with actual dollar figures. And this is true not just for cleanup grants, but really for all EPA brownfield grants. In addition, having a redevelopment plan in place is just going to make your proposal more competitive. You heard it earlier. Um, this is also true for RLS, which I don't specifically have up here. But um, for, for RLS, you want to make sure you have that redevelopment plan. Uh, you want to know that it's going to be in an area that has high redevelopment potential. It has a growing market and that developers are actually interested in getting uh, loans from you. And in addition, if you are going to be applying for an RLF, you want to be able to handle financial transactions. For example, um, you know, somebody that might be a redevelopment agency is probably best suited to do an RLF. Next slide. So we also have some lessons learned um, from things we've seen over the past couple of years in the evolving competitiveness of these grant applications. Um, first thing, you heard this, start early. You need to have a vision. Many communities don't tie it all together. They lose focus, and they either don't have a vision, or more likely, they fail to convey that vision in their grant application. So you need to answer the question, how does this project that you are proposing tie into the community's vision? Next bullet point is to have your draft applications reviewed. Um, again, this could be kind of two things. One is it really could be by a third party. It could be someone in-house that isn't as close to the program as you are. Um, they could check it for the re readability to make sure that you have a consistent message, that you're hitting your message. Just give them a copy of the guidelines. Give them a copy of this of uh, your draft grant proposal to review. And then in addition, as you heard, um, all of the TAB providers provide this service where we will review your draft grant application for free. Um, so send it to us. We're happy to look at it and give you our comments on it, particularly on the content of it. Um, you really kind of need another editor to look at things like um, grammar and awkward sentence structure and spelling and things like that. So, um, you know, Take advantage of all your resources there. Next is really just know the importance of planning. Many communities um, aren't doing a good job of showing how their project ties in with their existing plans, be it a master plan, a redevelopment plan, or any other plan. So really think about that. Um, make sure you make those ties when you write it. Hopefully you can also discuss how the community had input into those existing plans and vision. And then you can speak to how you're going to keep them involved. Next up is partnering. Um, you need to identify those partners really early on. You should be doing that now for this next set of um, grants. Find ones that are relevant to your project. Get them involved now. We have a list on this slide of potential partners. Um, but I would specifically recommend making sure you have at least one academic institution one economic development organization, maybe a chamber of commerce, at least one grassroots organization, perhaps an environmental group, and at least one neighborhood or community organization, as well as one faith-based organization. And we do find it's interesting kind of across the country on the faith-based thing. Um, some areas, like down south, if you get a reviewer from down south, they're going to be 
you know, taken aback if you don't have a faith-based organization um, in your program because in the South, it's such a very important part of the community, whereas perhaps up North, it's maybe not as important part of the community, but we would definitely recommend trying to have some sort of faith-based organization um, as one of your partners. And as Stephen mentioned earlier, you don't want to letter, include a letter from your congressman or your senator in this. That is not who they're looking for. In fact, if you do that, you may just cause extra work for your EPA reviewer within your region, which probably isn't going to help you score better. Um, you also want to connect the dots from the impacts to the outcomes, basically from that community needs section all the way through the project benefits. And my last tip is to quantify, quantify, quantify. This is such a competitive process. The reviewers are looking for anything so they don't have to award the full points. And it's not because they're mean people, but because they have to differentiate between applications. So again, you need to provide data, give numbers, and cite your sources. So for example, if you're going to say our target community suffers from a disproportionate number of aging housing stock and high vacancy rates, you need to give the statistics to back that up. We know this is hard, especially when you get to that project benefit section. For example, if you're writing a community-wide assessment grant, you may not even know what sites you're going to assess right now, let alone what the reuse of them is going to be. So how are you supposed to come up with actual numbers on those project benefits? Look at your targets. If you say you're going to address a total of five sites and your focus is on mixed-use development in the downtown, estimate how many temporary and permanent jobs could be created on a typical site, then multiply that by your five sites, take a look at the taxes generated on a similar project, and multiply that by five. Make sure you include qualifiers so the reviewer understands that these are estimates. The more concrete, the more you can convince the reviewers that you've given this a lot of thought, that you've done your homework, and that you understand what it's going to take to assess or clean up the site, the better off you're going to be. Now, we know that writing a winning EPA grant, Brownfield grant proposal can seem challenging, but with these tips from everybody on this webinar, you are halfway there. And you have plenty of people to help you, including your friends at your EPA regional brownfield office and your TAB providers. I hope these tips help you and wish you all much success. With that, I'd like to hand it back over to Ignacio Dayret of SeaClear. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth, Blaze, and our speakers, Anne, Steve, and Logan. And thank you to our audience for listening. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, one is relating to how many people actually write these grants, and uh, I think it varies. We have uh, experience with some people, uh, just a, a single person on their staff, but we actually work have worked with teams of people within other organizations. And I'm going to go through, uh, uh, while we're gathering more questions, uh, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Langan, uh, for uh, sponsoring this presentation. And we'd also like uh, to remind everyone to register and attend Brownfields 2017 in Pittsburgh in December. Uh, CCLEAR, uh, NGIT, and K-State will be there. And you can prick our brains, especially that will probably be the time when grants are due. So we expect to have a lot of fans out there. And lastly, we will have, uh, if you have a site that you're actually deep in the throes of the redeveloping, we, you can get tips uh, from uh, on the redevelopment rodeo at Brownfield 2017. It's sort of a case study. Give us the details of your site. We will analyze it with you before the app, uh, uh, before Brownfield 2017. You'll we'll actually have uh, expert advice doing these panels. Uh, we have a couple more questions here. Uh, are you what if you are working on a reservation the the value of land differs from cities and that's very true our reservations have a very unique situation and uh, many of your sites have cultural relevance 
and many of your sites you're trying to preserve or restore to uh, its original state. And sometimes you're working on economic development. It really varies on your situation. And you can just explain that on, on your grant application and consult with your tabber, and they will give you good tips on how to address that. Uh, are there any other questions? I think we have uh, uh, exhausted all the questions. We will answer anything we have missed by email. Again, thank you for tuning in, and uh, see you on our next webinar. Uh, goodbye. <laughs>